Welcome back to Come to Zion. I am your host, Ben, and today's episode, we are going to focus on the third principle of building up Zion. For the last several episodes, and I will make a playlist so that you'll know what I'm talking about, uh, we have been focusing on this talk of Come to Zion by Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the October 2008 General Conference um, talk. Uh, he talked about building Zion. And the reason we have been focusing on this talk is because of the invitation by our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, who gave us a invitation this past general conference in, this, in an address to the church. And in an address to the church, and I'm going to go over there right now, reread this, this invitation. And it got me to thinking about Zion, and we've been focusing on the principles of building Zion for the last several episodes. So this is from President Russell M. Nelson, right here, October 2022, in the talk, Overcome the World and Find Rest. And he, he says, one crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. A people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world, a people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. I call upon you, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. Cherish and honor your covenants above all other commitments. So, this invitation to become this righteous people, which led me to think about what is that? And that's Zion. You're to become the people of Zion, the city, the people of Zion, or Zion itself is a city, the city of holiness, where we are to prepare it for the Savior to return. We are to prepare it in our, in, in, prepare Zion in our hearts, in our families, and then we go out and, and prepare Zion and build Zion in our, our wards or church congregations and our stakes or the boundaries of, 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 of your stake or in your neighborhood, or your city to build a people and to become a people who have chosen Jesus Christ, but that are ready and worthy to receive him when he comes again. So we've been talking about the last several episodes, the principle of unity Let's go back to Elder D. Dr. Stofferson's talk and reread this paragraph to kind of set the stage of, of where we're going to lead into today. So Elder D. Dr. Stofferson says, Zion is Zion because of the character, attributes, and faithfulness of her citizens. Remember, the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness and there was no poor among them. If we would establish Zion in our homes, branches, wards, and stakes, we must rise to this standard. It will be necessary, and these are things we have talked about, number one, to become unified in one heart and one mind. We talked about that principle. We talked about being united in our testimony of Jesus Christ, but becoming one with him and knowing what he wants, us, wants you or I to do. Or as a people to do, right? To, to gather Israel, but to, to follow um, <clears throat> his commandments, to listen to listen to li to listen for him, so that he can speak things unto us about the things that we need to, need to do in our specific area. But being united means being united with with the Savior and our Heavenly Father, being united with those that are around us, and we we take away contention. And we take away strife, and we take away conflict, and we learn to forgive one another. Just as the Savior did when he was on this earth, by becoming one with those around us. Number two, the other principle that we talked about, to become individually and collectively a holy people. Talked about becoming holy, living the commandments, attending the temple, or getting on the covenant path. To be on our way to be a holy people. And we pointed out a talk by the prophet Russell M. Nelson. Who talked about temple worship. Who talked about building our foundation on 
our building our spiritual foundation and making it a focus to go to the temple and to live our covenants, to be on the covenant path. These are the things that we are invited to do. And the number three, which we are going to focus on today, is to care for the poor and needy with such effectiveness that we eliminate poverty among us. And it says, we cannot wait till Zion comes for these things to happen. Zion will come only as they happen. So today, we're going to talk about this principle of caring for the poor and needy and what way, how can we do this? Do we need to solve the world's problems? No, but we're going to understand that we solve it within our sphere of influence and working with the Lord side by side. So as I was, let's go ahead and read part of what Elder D. Todd Christofferson was telling, is t- telling us, told us about caring for the poor. And then we're going to look at a scripture that, that, came to my mind as as I was looking into this principle and then and then show what the prophet has has taught us in his during his time as the prophet and leader of this church giving us direction in building Zion for the last several years and yes we can find these principles time and time again as we as we look and we study and we become that those right the righteous people worthy and ready to receive the Lord. So here is caring for the poor. Caring for the poor. Elder D. Tucker Stofferson tells us throughout history, the Lord has measured societies and individuals by how well they cared for the poor. He has said, For the earth is full and there is enough to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel, unto the poor and the needy he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. You can find that in Doctrine and Covenants, section 104. Right? So the earth is full. We're taught that there's enough to spare. There's enough to go around. And we, we have to be willing to impart with our, poor, to impart with our abundance, right? We have, we have enough. And then some, some of us to be able to give, to impart according to the law of my gospel, to impart not his porch, which I have made. Right? We take of the abundance and part with it to help the poor and those in need and those in distress. Let's, let's go ahead and read a little bit further from Elder D. Tucker Stofferson. Furthermore, he declares, in your temporal things you shall be equal, and this not grudgingly. Otherwise, the abundance of the manifestations of the Spirit shall be withheld. You must give, right? You'd be equal in your temporal things and do it, this not grudgingly, not complaining that you have to give up some of your surplus of materials, your abundance, right? Otherwise, the abundance of the manifestations of the Spirit shall be withheld. How are we doing? If you're asked today to give of more than what you have, would you be willing to impart with it? The law of the fast. When we fast as a church on the first Sunday of the month, are you willingly imparting or giving away part of that money to fast offerings to help the poor and the needy? For the two meals that we skip, that we don't eat, and we give the money of that, are we providing our abundance, our surplus? That's extra money that we have that we don't spend on on food. Are we giving that to the poor and those in need? Are we submitting fast offerings? Those fast offerings are used to help those in your community, your church congregation in the ward. That's how it works within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if, and then it, and then 
Elder Christofferson continues, We control the disposition of our means and resources, but we account to God for this stewardship over earthly things. It really isn't ours. We're just taking care of the things that have been given to us. It is gratifying to witness your generosity as you contribute to fast offerings and humanitarian projects. Over the years, the suffering of millions has been alleviated and countless others have been enabled to help themselves through the generosity of the saints. Nevertheless, as we pursue the cause of Zion, each of us should prayerfully consider whether we are doing what we should and all that we should in the Lord's eyes with respect to the poor and the needy. Are we asking for help? Are we doing a little bit better? Can can you or I do a little bit better in this area to strengthen Zion, to build Zion, to, to, to be a part of that people worthy and ready to receive the Lord when he comes again? This is part of it. And if we don't know what to do or how to do it, pray. That's the key right there. Prayerfully consider whether you are doing what you should and all that you should. We're going to get an invitation from the prophet and from one of his from his one of his uh, talks given to us about caring for the poor and those in need. We're going to cover that in just a second. So we might as ask ourselves, living as many of us do in societies that worship possessions and pleasures, whether we are remaining aloof from covetousness and the lust to acquire more and more of this world's goods. Materialism is just one more manifestation of the idolatry and pride that characterize Babylon. Perhaps we can learn to be content with what is sufficient for our needs. Are we accumulating things just to accumulate things? It's hard. When things come out, when new things are, are, are brought forth in, in to, to buy in stores... Do we just want to go buy it just to have it? Or are we learning to be content with what is sufficient for our needs instead of getting what we want? Are we paying for those things? Are we in debt to, to, to buying things that we don't need? Now, I'm not saying it should be, it's wrong, right? It's not, it's not wrong to buy things, but are you buying more than you should? Perhaps we can learn to be content with what is sufficient for our needs. I'm going to continue, and then we'll move on to the next. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy against people who suppose that gain is godliness. Said he, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Let us be content with the things we need and not spend more and more on things that we don't truly need. Take care of your needs and then look to take care of the needs of others. This is a hard principle, one that I could surely work on, of living, living to just be sufficient for your needs and having that abundance to go and take care of those that are in need, who need to have their needs met. Instead of just building and building and building and building and consuming and consuming, are we looking out for those in need? As we read part of what Elder D. Christofferson asks of us and says to us, I thought of a scripture in Matthew, about service, right? About taking care of those in need and what it means. We're going to turn to Matthew 25, chapter 25, verses 31. We're going to start there and read a little bit about this principle of caring for those in need and what it truly means and why is it so important. We're wanting to be one with the Lord and to become a righteous and, and more holy of a people, right? Are we doing what is asked? Verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. 
the Son of Man being our Savior, Jesus Christ, coming again, sitting upon his throne, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come. Right? He's dividing us up. Let one on the right, one on the left. We want to be on the right. And what do those people on the right hand do to be on the right side? Not be the goats. Then shall the king say unto them. Oh, that's 34. I just read that. 35. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Fairly I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. When we are taking care of the poor and those in need who are asking for help, we are serving the Savior. We are serving our God. Are we doing that? Do we, do we think about those that are in need, who need our help? Are we doing what we can to take care of those in need? When the Savior or the King in this parable said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. It says in verse 40, I was reminded of a scripture in the Book of Mormon. Same principle that is taught, right? Same truth. We are serving others. This is from Mosiah chapter 2, verse 17. And this is King Benjamin talking to the people of the Nephites, talking about service. But it goes hand in hand with 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 what the Lord in the parable was saying. It says, verse 17, And behold, I tell you these things that you may learn wisdom, that you may learn that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. We serve others. We serve the least of us. We are serving God. We are serving the Lord. Are we doing what we can to serve God? those around us, especially giving away our abundance and, and helping those that are truly in need. If we think about it, this principle of giving to those in need or helping those in need, helping the poor. Right? The, the Savior did the same thing upon this earth. He helped the least of these. Those that are in need, those that are least in society, he fulfilled spiritual and temporal need. He gave of his abundance. Are we doing the same? How are we doing? So, this brings us into what the prophet has told us since he's been the prophet, since he's been the leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, leading under the direction of our Savior Jesus Christ, who is the head of this church. And see what he has said. So in a talk given in October 2019, like we've been in all these October conference addresses, but in a talk labeled, titled, The Second Great Commandment by President Russell Nelson. Let's see these things that he is he addressed. 
talking about the second great commandment, because that's what we are to do is to love others, right, as ourselves. And he's going to say that. But let's read what he's, he's taught us. Latter-day Saints, as with other followers, or all followers of Jesus Christ, are always looking for ways to help, to lift, and to love others. They who are willing to be called the Lord's people are willing to bear one another's burdens, to mourn with those that mourn, and to comfort those that stand in need of comfort. Those are, I would like to say, are part of our baptismal covenants, right? We promise to do these things when we are baptized. When we take upon the name of Christ, we promise, we, we say we are willing to bear one another's burdens, to mourn with those that mourn, and to comfort those that stand in need of comfort. That's those are those are that's that's what we promise to do. We take upon him name. We we are going to obey the Savior. We're going to obey his commandments, his direction, and then we're going to go and we're going to help other people. Right? What does he say? He says they truly. President Nelson again. They truly seek to live the first and second great commandments. When we love God with all our hearts. He turns our hearts to the well-being of others in a beautiful, virtuous cycle. It would be impossible to calculate the amount of service that Latter-day Saints render around the globe every day of every year, but it is possible to calculate the good the church as an organization does to bless men and women, boys and girls who are in need of a helping hand. Are we helping? Two things stick out. He says, when we love, love God with all our hearts, we keep that first great commandment. He turns our hearts to the well-being of others in a beautiful, virtuous cycle. Isn't that awesome? Keep the first great commandment. He's going to help us keep that second great commandment. To love God with all our hearts. And he turns our hearts to the well-being of others. To really help each other out. And then he says, as I repeat it, right, he says it's impossible to calculate the amount of service, but we can calculate the good the church as an organization does to bless men and women. And we can do that. We don't know everything, right? As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we don't log in service time or talk about what we do to give to those in need. If we are doing what we covenant to do, we are we're merely doing it. But he says the church can calculate the amount of service, right? Here's a couple things the way to calculate. This is 2019. If we go to an article given in, that is written in September 28, 2022, right? The title, Recent $37 million in church donations come after a year of unprecedented giving and service. There's the there's what he's saying. We can calculate the good that we do as, as a church as a whole, right? The church itself. But yeah. But it is possible to calculate the good the church as an organization does to bless men and women. So here's the here's the good that we as the church are doing. Recent thirty seven million dollars. Let's read a part of what what has been said. When the church gave thirty two million dollars to the United Nations World Food Program on September fourteenth, it marked the faith's largest one time contribution to a humanitarian organization to date. Right? Giving to those that are poor and are in need. The donation presented by Bishop L. Todd Budge, second counselor in the presiding bishopric in Rome, Italy, will help provide food and critical assistance to 1.6 million people facing food crisis in nine countries. On September 21st, the church announced a $5 million donation to UNICEF to help fight global malnutrition and among children under age 5 and up in to 20 four countries. These two recent donations carry on decades old priority of the church to care for those in need, principle of Zion, including nearly one billion dollars in donations in the year 2021 alone. Right? So the prophet says we can calculate what the church as an organization does. Right? These are the things that we are doing now to help build Zion up as a church as <clears throat> as it's organized. 
In 2021, the church and its members took part in 3,909 humanitarian projects in 188 countries with 6.8 million hours of volunteer work. Bishop Budge said in a recent interview with the Church News, the humanitarian outreach of the church is given without regard to race, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, or any of those things, the labels that tend to divide us. We reach out to everyone, all of God's children, because God loves them all. Right? We're helping everyone. And we talk about building Zion in our little sphere of influence in our, our surrounding community or church or in our family. Right? We do it because of the love of God for everyone. We're reaching out. We're building Zion by eliminating poverty among us. That's what Elder D. Ta Christofferson said with such effectiveness. Let's see what else it says from helping refugees to clean water projects, self reliance courses, and disaster relief. The Church of Jesus Christ gets involved because it is what the Savior taught, explained presiding bishop Gerald Casse in a church news interview. Helping others and reaching out to the people in need is really at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be the Church of Jesus Christ if we did not follow or strive to follow his example every day. Are we following his example? What are you doing, you yourself, not taking upon the burden of the world and trying to solve the world's problem, but solving it in your family or in your, in your sphere of influence? How are you helping others and how are you able, reaching out to those who need help? And how do we do that? We're going to talk about that in, in just a second. I'm going to go back to the prophet and what he has said. Some other things that he said during this conference, this, this, this conference address. He says, to assist members of the Lord's church in distress, we love and live the ancient law of the fast. Which was explained a little bit earlier. Right? We go, he says, we go hungry to help others who are hungry. And one day each month we go without food and donate the cost of that food and more to help those in need. Then he says, and as, as members of the church, we feel a kinship to those who suffer in any way. As sons and daughters of God, we are all brothers and sisters. We heed an Old Testament admonition. Thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy. All right? In the Old Testament. Where's this at? This is in. Look in the footnotes. It's in Deuteronomy 15.11. And that is where we find it. Let's go ahead and click on it real quick. I'll take you there if the oh take us there real quick. For the there's a fifteen eleven says in Deuteronomy, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Give of your abundance. Help those in need. Do what you can do. See what you can do to help. Let's go back to President Nelson real quick. And then he goes on and he he goes on and he quotes that scripture, Matthew 25. Talks about several other things that the church is doing to re help relieve hunger. The church operates 124 bishop storehouses throughout the world. Through them, approximately 400,000 food orders are given each year to individuals in need. In locations where there are no storehouse, where no storehouse exists, bishops and branch presidents draw from fast offering funds of the church to provide food and supplies for their needy members, or those members that are in need. However, the challenge of hunger goes far beyond the boundaries of the church. It is increasing throughout the world. Right, so this challenge of hunger, it is increasing throughout the world. A recent United Nations report indicated that the number of undernourished people in the world now exceeds 820 million, or almost one in nine of the Earth's inhabitants. And I imagine since this is 2019, that it's gone up. I imagine that it's gone up. Hopefully, we're doing what we can to get it down. And then we are to end... 
think there's one more thing. Oh, yes. Read what he says towards the end. He says, Thus our greatest joys come as we help our brothers and sisters, no matter where we live in this wonderful world. Our greatest joy comes as we help. Giving help to others, making a more conscious a conscious effort to care about others as much as or more than we care about ourselves is our joy. That word joy again. Especially, I might add, when it's not convenient and when it takes us out of our comfort zone. Here's the key. Living that second great commandment is the key to becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Are we reaching out? Are we stopping to help or think about helping? In times of inconvenience and in times where we feel totally uncomfortable. Right? I might add, when it is not convenient and when it is, takes us out of our comfort zone. When we are helping others, it brings joy. Think about that. When you have helped another, if you helped someone in your family or a friend or someone, you, a stranger, when you have helped someone, how have you felt? How does it make you feel? Does it bring joy? Is that is this on our mind? As we serve the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, are we serving those around us and helping those that are in need? And again, I bring this up. How do we do this? How are we supposed to do this in the Lord's way? And I'm going to segue into another address and then we will end it after we read a couple things and this is from elder or at the time of this this conference address elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf and at the time he was president Uchtdorf he was a member of the first presidency um, in 2011 he was served alongside when, when the prophet at the time was Thomas S. Mutson so he was he was in uh, he was in the uh, the first presidency but now he's elder Dorf. member of the quorum of the 12 in 2011 he speaks about providing in the lord's way so here's how we can accomplish what we have been asked to do to be able to to effectively help others around us and we're we're turning to this talk, and then we're we'll we'll wrap it up here. This conference address by Elder Uchtdorf was given in 2011, uh, called "Providing in the Lord's Way." We go down to the subhead. It says we are enlisted, and he's he's talking to you right now to the men of the church. But what I say will apply to to everybody, and this is how we this is how we provide in the Lord's way. How to help those in need, those that are poor and in need, temporally and spiritually. He says, this very hour, there are many members of the church who are suffering. They are hungry, stretched financially, and struggling with all manner of physical, emotional, and spiritual distress. They pray with all the energy of their souls for succor and for relief. He says, brethren, please do not think that this is someone else's responsibility. It is mine and it is yours. We are all enlisted. All means all. Every Aaronic and priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood holder, rich or poor, in every nation. In the Lord's plan, there is something everyone can contribute. You can contribute to building up Zion in however you see fit. However you can contribute. The lesson we learn generation after generation is that rich and poor are all under the same sacred obligation to help their neighbor. It will take all of us, and all of us, working together to successfully apply the principles of welfare and self-reliance. Right? Helping those that are in need, distressed. Too often, 
We notice the needs around us, hoping that someone from far away will magically appear to meet those needs. Perhaps we wait for experts with specialized knowledge to solve specific problems. When we do this, we deprive our neighbor of the service we could render, and we deprive ourselves of the opportunity to serve. While there is nothing wrong with experts, let's face it, there will never be enough of them to solve all the problems. Right? We cannot wait for somebody else to do this, to help eliminate poverty, to help alleviate suffering, relieve the suffering of those in need, right? Temporally and spiritually. What are we to do? Instead, the Lord has placed his priesthood and his organization at our doorsteps in every nation where the church is established. And right by its side, he has placed the Relief Society. As we priesthood holders know, no welfare effort is successful if it fails to make use of the remarkable gifts and talents of our sisters. The Lord's way is not to sit at the side of the stream and wait for the water to pass before we cross. It is to come together, roll up our sleeves, go to work, and build a bridge or a boat to cross the waters of our challenges. You men of Zion, you priesthood holders, are the ones who can lead out and bring relief to the saints by applying the inspired principles of the welfare program. It is your mission to open your eyes, use your priesthood, and go to work in the Lord's way. Zion, right? Cannot sit by. Isn't that the same thing that Elder Christofferson said in 2008? Zion will only come as it happens. It won't just come because it's just going to happen. You read that quote word for word. I don't want to. He says, right, same thing. We've read time and time again. Zion, we cannot wait for Zion until Zion comes for these things to happen. Zion will come only as they happen. The same principle. We got to go to work. We have a work to do. How are we doing? How are we doing in the work of helping those around us? So how do we do it? How do we provide in the Lord's way? Here's some suggestions that he gives. Some direction. I shouldn't say suggestions. They are directions on how to help in the Lord's way. The place to begin is to familiarize ourselves with what the Lord has already revealed. We should not assume that we know. We need to approach the subject with the humility of a child. Come with questions. Ask. Learn. Every generation must learn anew the doctrines that undergird the Lord's way of caring for the needy. As many prophets have instructed us over the years, the welfare principles of the church are not simply good ideas. They are revealed truths from God. They are his way of helping the needy. Brethren and sisters, study the revealed principles and doctrines first. Read the handbooks regarding church welfare. Take advantage of the internet website, providentliving.org. Find out about the Lord's... Wait, reread the June 2011 Liahona and Enzyme article on the church welfare plan. Find out about the Lord's way of providing for his saints. Learn how the principles of care for the needy, service to, the neighbor, service to neighbor, and self-reliance complement each other. The Lord's way of self-reliance involves, in a balanced way, many facets of life, including education, health, employment, family finances, and spiritual strength. Familiarize yourself with the modern welfare program of the church. Right? Resources to go to. Be able to study and to go to the Lord and, and, and be taught. Be taught his way of helping the needy. His way of helping the poor, helping those that are distressed. Once you have studied the doctrines and principles of the church-wide welfare plan, Elder Uchtdorf continues, seek to apply what you have learned to the needs of those within your stewardship. Right? So study it and then go do. Be a hearer of the word, but do it, be a doer of the word as well. Seek to apply what you've learned. What this means is that in large measure, you're going to have to figure it out for yourself. 
every family, every congregation, every area of the world is different. There is no one-size-fits-all answer in church welfare. It is a self-help program where individuals are responsible for personal self-reliance. Our resources include personal prayer, our own God-given talents and abilities, the assets available to us through our own families and extended family members, various community resources, and of course, the caring of support caring support of priesthood quorums and the Relief Society. This will lead us through inspired pattern of self-reliance. We help those in need, those that are, are poor, we help them to become self-reliant. We help those out, we help those in need to help them better their lives in a way that the Lord wants us to. We have our we have our own resources. Right? We can learn from the church but really, what we do and how we serve and how we take care of others is dependent upon not just us, but what we can learn from we can learn from prayer when we pray and ask for help. Let's read what he says. You're going to have to chart a course that is consistent with the Lord's doctrine and matches the circumstances of your geographic area. Right? We've got to work with the Lord. You're not working by yourself. You're working with the Lord. To implement divine welfare principles, you need not look always to Salt Lake City. Instead, you need to look into the handbooks, right? into your heart, and into heaven. Trust the Lord's inspiration and follow his way. In the end, you must do in your area what disciples of Christ have done in every dispensation. Counsel together. Use all resources available. Seek the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Ask the Lord for his confirmation. And then roll up your sleeves and go to work. I give you a promise. If you will follow this pattern, you will receive specific guidance as to the who, what, when, and where of providing in the Lord's way. That's a promise. So if we study, if we seek to to come as a child and learn and ask the Lord to teach us about welfare, his welfare program, to teach about how to help others to be self-reliant, to help those that are in need. And then we, we chart a course that is consistent with the Lord's doctrine. We match it with where we're at in our sphere of influence. And we look to what the church says, to what we feel in our heart and to heaven. We learn, we, work alongside with the Lord man the promise I give you a promise right if we do the things that we're supposed to do as disciples of Christ in our area in your sphere of influence in your family in your heart in your family in in those around you your your neighborhood your city your stake doesn't have to be the world but it could be the area that you live in if you do these things, there's the promise. If you will follow this pattern, you will receive specific guidance as to the who, what, when, and where of providing in the Lord's way. So if there's any confusion as to what today's episode is about, we wrap it up, sum it up. We are to take care of each other. We are to take care and seek out and look for and watch out for those that are in need those that are poor, those that need our help, those that beg for help, those that ask for help. And if we don't know who's asking for help, when we go to the Lord, the Lord's going to tell you. And then we have to have the courage to only, not only step out of our comfort zone and to do it when it's convenient, not convenient. Right? Build up this principle of Zion, to help this principle of Zion, but to, you know, to serve to give your abundance, to not collect so much materials, to not buy, to just buy. We are to help those around us. I'm going to leave this with what the prophet said. Living that second great commandment is the key to becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a part of the people, 
that are ready and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again. You must love him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. And then you're to keep that second great commandment. So that we can all come unto him and rejoice when he comes again. Go out and seek and find. So here's my invitation to act. Find out. And, and I would use... I'll post this talk of, of providing in the Lord's way, right? I would... I would go and seek and find out, and if you haven't done it, learn about the ch church welfare. Learn about how learn about the principles of caring for the needy, service to neighbors. Learn about it. Work with the Lord. Pray. Ask questions. And then go go do. I'm going to work on this. I invite you to work on this. And and. By doing so, we will receive that specific promise from, from Elder Uchtdorf about knowing where to go or what direction we need to go. And, and you know, counsel with your family. Counsel with those that are you, you, your friends, you know, in your quorums. Talk about how we can help. So that's it for today. If you... Um, enjoyed this episode or you learned something or you are learning or you have had good thoughts come your way and you know you're in better direction I I ask you I just say go follow go do what it is asked of you go follow the good things in your in your mind and go follow the good things in your heart and stay close to the Lord um, but I invite you to go and help look for those in need help those around you so that we can all be a little bit better and eliminate what was asked to eliminate poverty among us with such effectiveness. What to care for the poor and needy with such effectiveness that we eliminate poverty among us. Go do it. If you if you if you will, if you like this episode, if you liked anything that you heard, please make a comment down below. If you have questions, suggestions. Uh, feel free to share this this episode. Feel free to please subscribe. Please like this episode. And until then, God be with you until we meet again. And may God bless you and you.